to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in christian worship the bible says we are to sing and make melody in our heart to the Lord. Ephesians 5, verse number 19. We're so glad that you've joined us today for our study of singing and music in Christian worship. What does the Bible say? What does the New Testament teach about singing? What does it teach about Christian music in worship? And so we want to think today about God's Word and its teaching on this issue. And so we hope you'll find your Bible. Have it ready as we're going to let the Word of God be our guide on this subject. As always, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study. We want to encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to know more about the church, about worship, what they believe and teach on salvation, you'll find people at the Lord's Church in your area, the Church of Christ, who love God, who are concerned about souls, and who more than anything want to help people get to heaven. Friend, we'd also like to help you here at the Gospel of Christ. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you'll find a wide variety of good Bible study material. We have video lessons, audio lessons, study questions, transcripts, and all of that is free, available to you free of charge, and we believe it'll be a good help in your study along with the Word of God. And so we encourage you to check out our website. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, we also make that available to you free of charge. You can get a digital download or a DVD or CD. Uh, we'll mail that to you free of charge as well. Just fill out the media request form from our website and we'll make that available to you. And friend, in our fast-paced world today, we also want to encourage you to check out our app that is available both for the Apple and Android phones in the respective marketplace stores there. To begin our study in thinking about music and singing in the uh, Lord's Church for today. We've got to begin by thinking about where our authority in everything we do is. Where does our authority in what we do, where's that found at? The New Testament teaches Christians are only to do what we're told by God to do, what we're authorized in the Scriptures to do. And we learn that from several various passages. Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus says this, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And so when we think about who the source or the head of the church is today, the one with all authority, that's Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. We're to do what he tells us to do. John 2 verse 5, the words of Jesus' mother to the servants at the wedding of Cana should ring true in our ears and in our hearts. She said to those servants, as Jesus is about to perform the miracle in Cana at the wedding, whatever he says to you, do it. That needs to be my mindset and my attitude. Whatever Jesus says, I need to do it. And then of course, we hear from Paul in Colossians 3, verse 17, where he says, Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And so again, whatever we do, our words or our actions, we've got to follow Christ and His teaching. This is why the Bible will say in several places that we're not to go beyond the teaching of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, we're not to go beyond what's written. If it's found in the pages of the Bible, we want to do it. If it's not in there, don't go beyond that. Revelation 22, 18 and 19 words it this way, we're not to add to nor take away from the things written in the book. The proverb writer said in the long ago, in Proverbs 30, verse 6, do not add to his word lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. And so the Word of God, the New Testament teaches, we're only to do 
what we're authorized to do. The New Testament also teaches our law today is the New Testament of Jesus Christ. I'm not living under, and I'm not going to be judged by the Old Testament. The Bible says in Colossians 2 verse 14 that the handwriting of requirements was nailed to the cross. Ephesians 2 verse 14, uh, the law which is contrary to us was taken out of the way. And so the Ten Commandments, the Ten Old Testament law, it was nailed to the cross and we're not living under that today. Hebrews 8 verse 12 and 13 says, in that God set a new covenant. He made the first covenant, the old covenant, obsolete. What's growing old and becoming obsolete, Paul would say, or the Hebrew writer said, is ready to vanish away. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, prophesied a new covenant was coming. And then you have the teaching of Romans 7, 1 through 4. And Paul uses the, illage of, the, the illustration of marriage to show that when one spouse dies, you're no longer bound to that and you can be married to another. And his whole point is, you can be married to Christ and His covenant because the old law is out and the new law is in. And so we learn from the Bible that our authority, we must only do what we're authorized. Our authority is found in the Word of God. And for Christians, our authority and how we're saved and how we worship is found in in the New Testament of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let's emphasize that God expects me and God expects you, God expects us to do what His Word and His authority tells us to do. God didn't just give us the Bible as good suggestions. When we don't do what God specifically tells us, there are consequences. Let me give you a couple of those. 2 Samuel chapter 6, um, David is transporting the ark, and they're transporting it, text tells us, on a new cart. And so they go to get the ark, they put it on a new cart, they're coming back through a place called Nashon's threshing floor, naturally with a threshing of wheat. That would be a rather rough area. Um, the oxen stumble, and the cart begins to tip, and the ark begins to fall, and uh, uh, Uzzah and Ahi are driving that, and Uzzah, in 2 Samuel 6, because he loves God and what the ark stands for, he didn't want anything to happen to it. He reaches out to make sure it doesn't fall and get broke. Drops right there on the spot dead. The text tells us David kind of became angry. He didn't know why that happened. He didn't know what was going on there, and he really didn't understand that. But later, David thought about that event, and he helps us to learn. God means what he says and wants us to do that. Listen to what the Bible teaches about this event in 1 Chronicles 15, verse 13 and 15. Concerning this same event, the Bible says, For because you did not do it the first time in transporting the ark, the Lord our God broke out against us, notice this, because we did not consult Him about the proper order. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles. Now watch this. As Moses had commanded them according to the word of the Lord. Why did, I, why did Uzzah die? Because there was a right and a wrong way to transport the ark. They didn't follow God's plan, and that was wrong. Same is true for today. When God tells us what to do, he wants us to do that. Leviticus 10 verses 1 and 2, Nadab and Abihu offered a strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And God rained down fire from heaven and destroyed those two men. What did Nadab and Abihu do wrong? They still offered the sacrifice. Just they might, We might think of that as kind of a small thing where the fire came from, which God had not commanded them. And so remember trying to emphasize that from the reading of the Bible, when God tells us what He wants, that's exactly what He wants, and He doesn't need my help. He doesn't want us to change that. Well, what if we're under the New Testament today as our law, what then does God say about singing and music for Christians today? Here are the passages in the Bible, in the New Testament, here are the passages that talk about it. Matthew 26, verse 30, the Bible says that Jesus and His disciples sang a hymn. And they went out. They sang 
Uh, Acts 16, verse 25. Paul and Silas were in prison. They were singing and praying, and the prisoners were listening to them. Jesus and his disciples sang. Paul and the disciples of Christ in prison also sang. Listen to what the Bible says in the next mentioning of singing found in Romans chapter 15 and listen to the words of verse number 9. Paul says that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy as it is written, for this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. 1 Corinthians 14 verse number 15, I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding. Then listen to Ephesians chapter 5 verse number 19. The Bible says this, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. How are Christians to worship in song? Singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. Listen to the companion passage, Colossians 3 verse 16. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Again, teaching, singing, grace in our hearts. The next passage, Hebrews 2 verse 12. The Bible records this, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation or the assembly. I will sing to you. And then the final passage, James 5 verse 13. Is anyone happy? Let him sing psalms. As it relates to singing as an act of worship for Christians or the church here on earth, this is what the Bible teaches us about music or singing. Now, is singing a very important part of Christian worship? Sure it is. It's a way God's told us to worship Him. John 4 verse 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth, we, we want to sing out and do our best. But friend, please listen carefully. Under the old law, there were mechanical instruments, there were music, there was the offering of incense, there was animal sacrifices, there was the building of booths during times. There was a lot of things about their worship that we don't have in our worship today. And friend, let's understand this. Nowhere in the New Testament are mechanical instruments of music ever mentioned or authorized for Christians on this earth in their worship. There's no authority for it in the New Testament. Remember Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Don't add to or take away. Where's the authority in the New Testament? That's our law. That's what we're going to be judged by, John 12.48. That's where we look for worship. Where are mechanical instruments of music mentioned in that? And friend, I want you to hear this as well. Even from, from the past, many denominational leaders even realized instrumental music was not authorized. Let me give you just a few quotes from them. John Calvin, who came up with the doctrine of Calvinism, uh, he was a part of the Presbyterian Church. Here's what he said in his commentary on the book of Psalms. He said, Musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, lighting of lamps, the restoration of other shadows of the law, the papists, that is the Pope, therefore have foolishly barred these, as well as many other things from the Jews, men who are found of, fond of outward pomp, may delight in that noise, but the simplicity which God recommends for us by the apostle is far more pleasing to him. And so here he said, it'd be as authorized as offering incense or, or, or lighting some, none of that's authorized, he said. John Wesley, who is viewed as the founder of the Methodist church, had this to say about mechanical instruments of music. He said, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels provided they are neither seen nor heard. In essence, he said, we can't, it's not authorized. You can put it there, but we can't use it. It's just not authorized by God. Adam Clark, Methodist commentator, said this, Music as a science 
I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God I abominate and abhor. This is the abuse of music, and here I register my protest against all such corruptions in the worship of the author of Christianity. Charles Spurgeon, famous Baptist preacher, had this to say, I would as soon attempt to pray to God with machinery as to sing to Him with machinery. Friend, when you think about what the Bible teaches on instrumental music in the New Testament, that there's absolute silence on it, even people of various backgrounds, which today they may use them, realize, leaders of those, realize they just weren't authorized. And friend, think about this with me. We are to teach, Ephesians 5.19, we are to admonish, uh, Colossians 3.16, we are to exhort one another in our songs. Can an, a mechanical instrument of music do that? Can it teach? It doesn't have that ability. It, it can't do that. It, it's not able to. And friend, when you think about how God authorizes God doesn't have to specifically condemn something for that not to be acceptable. Let me give you an example. Hebrews 8 verse 5. Uh, when I think about God's law of uh, how something doesn't have to be specifically condemned for it not to be authorized, Hebrews 8 verse 5 and Hebrews 7 14 help us with that. In Hebrews 8 verse 5 God said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mount. And so there was a pattern to follow and yet in Hebrews 7 14 it is said concerning Jesus of the tribe of Judah in Hebrews 7 verse 14 for it is evident our Lord sprang out of Judah of which Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. His whole argument is this. Why can't Jesus be a priest according to the tribe of Judah? And his answer is, because Moses never said anything about Judah doing that. Well, did Moses condemn anybody from Judah? Did Moses specifically forbid anybody from Judah from being a priest? There's not a passage that says, of the, the tribe of Judah shall not be a priest. What is there a passage that says? The tribe of Levi shall. What's implied from that? When God said the Levites were to be priests, that excluded the other 11 tribes. And that's how God expected them to interpret it. Now, let's apply that to our modern world today. Someone says, well, I see there are passages about singing and the Bible never says anything about mechanical, in, mechanical uh, instruments of music, but it never says we can't do it. Does God have to say we can't? for it to be unauthorized. And from those passages, we learn that he doesn't, and we understand that today. Give you an example. Let's say that I invite you over to my house and we're gonna have a pizza. And we decide that we want pepperoni and black olives on the pizza. So we call up the local pizza shop and we say, we'd like to order a pizza, we want pepperoni and black olives on it. They say, okay, it'll be about 15 minutes, it'll be there. Doorbell rings, guy's standing there with a pizza. He says, is this your pizza? We open it up and it's got pepperoni, black olives, and it's got anchovies and pickles. Little Google-eyed fish, right? And we say, wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't order anchovies and pineapple. What would you say if that little guy said to you, you didn't tell us not to? Would he be right? Well, of course not. Why not? Because when you said, I want pepperoni and I want black olives, that excluded everything else. And friend, when God says sing, and when God says make melody in your heart, that's how God wants us to worship Him. Now, not only does the Bible teach that, not only do religious leaders from past centuries realize that, but the voice of history, even close to the New Testament, gives testament to the fact that the New Testament church did not use mechanical instruments of music in their worship. Listen to these quotes. Justin Martyr, who lived between 100 and 165, wrote this. The using with instrumental music, uh, the use of singing with instrumental music was not received in the Christian churches as it was among the Jews in the infant state, but only the use of the plain song. Someone writing that close to the first century said all they used was plain song. Origen, who lived around 185, 
He was a pupil of Clement of Alexandria, said, He who makes melody with a mind makes melody well, speaking spiritual songs and singing in his heart to God. In the Council of Laodicea, which is around 367, they forbid the use of musical instruments in worship, and this has remained the policy of the Eastern, or Eastern Orthodox Church to the present day. Um, give you some more examples. The Council of Carthage, which around 416, addressed the issue of instrumental music, and they said, On the Lord's day, let all instruments of music be silenced. Pope Vitalian was the first to introduce instrumental music into worship of the church in 670, and yet even then there was no general acceptance of it in the, in, in the Catholic congregations until around 1200. Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1225 to about 1274, he was a prominent Catholic scholar. He wrote this, The church does not use musical instruments such as the harp, or liar, when praising God, in case you should seem to fall back into Judaism, for musical instruments usually move the soul more to pleasure than to create inner moral goodness. And so what do we learn from all this from the scripture, from the example of other religious leaders, from the testament of people living close to the first century, from the New Testament church, just didn't worship that way. We don't find that in the New Testament. Well, what do we find then? Christians are to sing with all their heart to God. Sing and make melody in your heart. Don't sit there like a lump on a log, admonish one another, teach one another, uplift one another with the voice and with the words of the song. What are we to do? We're to think about and meditate on the words of the song. 1 Corinthians 14, 15. I'll sing with the Spirit. I'll sing with the understanding. I want to think about, as I th sing songs, as I sing songs like The Old Rugged Cross, as I th sing songs like How Beautiful Heaven Must Be, as I think about the words of those songs. Friend, the words involve the teaching and that involves ideas. Sing as though it's your opportunity to encourage or teach somebody. Colossians 3.16, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. This is an opportunity through our songs that are based on the teaching of the Bible. This might be your chance to teach somebody as they hear those words and as they're moved to obey God. What a powerful idea that is. Should our singing have a, a, emotion which is guided by the truth and feeling? Sure. John 4, verse 24, we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. Nothing wrong with emotion. Our singing ought to have that, but it's got to be guided according to God's truth. And so, friend, as we think today on this fundamental subject of singing and music in the New Testament church, we hope today that you understand our motivation. Our motivation is to speak the truth in love. Our motivation is to say what God has said, and our motivation is to point men and women to what the Bible teaches. Maybe this is not the way you've worshiped God in the past. Here's all that we ask you. Just search the New Testament for yourself. Look at the evidence and see if these things are true. Don't base it on popular opinion. Don't base it just on what somebody else says. Base it on the Word of God. And if these things are true, as to how Christians worshiped in the New Testament, then friend, let's align our lives with that idea. And so friend, as we bring things full circle and we think about the gospel of Christ today, we want to ask you to consider your own life. Are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the good news of Jesus Christ? You say, good news, what good news? Here's the news, the good news. You'll call His name Jesus. He'll save His people from their sins. Matthew 1, verses 19 through 21. He's able to save completely those to come, who come to God through Him. Hebrews 7, verse 25 through 27. And if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with God, and one day we can be faithful. Unto death we'll have a home in heaven. 
1 John 1, verses 7 through 10, Revelation chapter 2, verse number 10. And so the good news is Jesus saves. Won't you become a child of God today? Won't you submit to the will of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do you love him? Will you do what he says? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? The Lord said, unless you believe that I am he, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. As Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch about Christ and he sees somewhere to obey the gospel up in the distance and be baptized, he said, here's water, what hinders me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. Do you believe with all your heart? Acts 8, verse 36 through 38. Would you repent of sin and turn to God? Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Turn from that sin in your life and turn in repentance to God. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Jesus said in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, if you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you who is, confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And then to have every wrong, every sin, everything you've done that's evil washed away, would you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins? The Lord said it so plainly, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. He would later say, baptism does now save us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. And so our hope today is to point people to God, to His Son Jesus Christ, and to the Word of God. We hope this series of lessons on fundamentals of the Christian faith has been uplifting and encouraging. That It will motivate us to get out our Bible and study more and be what God wants us to be each and every day. And friend, if we can help you, uh, we want to do that. We love you. God loves you. We want to help you in any way. And our hope and prayer is you'll join us next time as we're going to study more about the Word of God in this program, The Gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.